My report is about rocky shores and soft bottom intertidal communities. The coastal zone as seen in the picture represents the transition from terrestrial to marine influences. It comprises not only shoreline ecosystems, but also the upland watersheds draining into coastal waters and the near shore sublittoral ecosystems influenced by land-based activities. The intertidal zone the intertidal zone is also known as the foreshore, seashore, and sometimes referred to as the littoral zone. It is the area exposed to the air at low tide and underwater at high tide. This zone can encompass sandy beaches, rocky shores, bays, and estuaries. The area can be a narrow strip as in Pacific Islands that have only a narrow tidal range or can include many meters of shoreline where shallow beach slope interacts with high tidal excursion. The intertidal zone is divided into four distinct regions, namely lower littoral zone, mid-littoral zone, upper mid-littoral zone, and the splash zone. Types of intertidal zone Intertidal habitats can be characterized as either hard or soft bottom substrates. Rocky intertidal communities occur on rocky shores such as headlands, cobble beaches, or human-made jetties. Soft sediment habitats include sandy beaches and intertidal wetlands such as mud flats and salt marshes. These habitats differ in levels of abiotic or non-living environmental factors. Rocky shores tend to have higher wave action, requiring adaptations, allowing the inhabitants to cling tightly to the rocks. Soft bottom habitats are generally protected from large waves but tend to have more variable salinity levels. Tidal ecology is the study of intertidal ecosystems where organisms live between the low tide and high tide lines. At low tide, the intertidal is exposed, whereas at high tide, the intertidal is underwater. The most important environmental and species interaction may vary based on the type of intertidal community being studied. The broadest of classification being based on substrates, the rocky shore and the soft bottom communities. Organisms living in the zone, a highly variable and often hostile environment, and have evolved various adaptations to cope with and even exploit these conditions. One easily visible feature of intertidal communities is vertical zonation. It is where the community is divided into distinct vertical bands of specific species going up the shore. Species' ability to cope with abiotic factors associated with immersion stress, such as desiccation, determines their upper limits, while biotic interactions uh, one of example is the competition with other species set their lower limits. Intertidal regions are utilized by humans for food and recreation, but anthropogenic actions also have major impacts with overexploitation, invasive species, and climate change actions being among the problems faced by intertidal communities. In some places, marine protected areas or MPAs have been established to protect these areas and aid in scientific research. Communities. In the intertidal zone, the most common organisms are small and most are relatively uncomplicated organisms. This is for a variety of reasons. Firstly, the supply of water which marine organisms require to survive is intermittent. Secondly, the wave action around the shore can wash away or dislodge poorly suited or adapted organisms. Third, because of the intertidal zone's high exposure to the sun, the temperature range can be extreme from very hot to near freezing in frigid, frigid climates. Lastly, the salinity is much higher in the intertidal zone because salt water trapped in rock pools evaporates, leaving behind salt deposits. These four factors make the intertidal zone an extreme environment in which to live. Organisms that live in this area experience daily fluctuations in their environment. For this reason, they must be able to tolerate extreme changes in temperature, salinity, moisture, and wave action to survive. 
Variety of organisms depends on the types of bottom or substrates, namely the rocky shore and the soft bottom or sandy substrates. Organism characteristics that lives in intertidals are the immersion and the immersion. Immersion means being out of the water and exposed to air and immersion being submerged in the water. Rocky shores are the most common littoral habitat on open wave exposed coast and constitute many sheltered and enclosed coastlines such as sea locks, fjords, and rias. This already extensive natural habitat is further increased by the plethora of artificial hard structures such as offshore platforms, docks, dikes, breakwaters, and seawalls, all of which essentially function as artificial rocky shores. Their accessibility to man has rendered them susceptible to a variety of impacts since prehistoric times. They are subject to anthropogenic impacts originating from both the land and sea. They are obviously also subject to a wide range of natural fluctuations on various temporal and spatial scales. Therefore, there is a considerable challenge in unraveling anthropogenic change from natural variability. From a management perspective, rocky shores are more amenable to regulation than the open sea as access and discharges can be restricted. Furthermore, a wealth of knowledge of rocky shore ecology is in available to inform management decisions and compliance monitoring programs. Why are rocky shores important? For one, they provide a home for a lot of organisms and serve as a nursery area for many fish and crustacean species. They provide shelter in areas where seaweeds break the wave's power and provide food for fishes. Rocky shores have algal beds that serve as an important food source for rare and threatened species like sea turtles. It also serves as a feeding ground at low tide for wading birds and is also used for stabilization of inshore sediment. Vertical Zonation of a Rocky Shore Rocky intertidal community is usually divided into bands or zones at characteristic heights within the intertidal. Vertical zonation is the pattern of banding that says that any given species are usually not found throughout the intertidal but only within a particular vertical range. Classification of a rocky shoreline's vertical zonation is the splash zone, high tide zone, mid tide zone, and the low tide zone. This is seen in the picture. The upper intertidal, where the periwinkles are dominant, limpets, lichens, and crusting algae also common. In the middle intertidal, the barnacles, the mussels, and the seaweeds. In the lower intertidal are the seaweeds and the surf grass. Splash zone, or known as the upper intertidal zone. Inhabitants must be well adapted to withstand exposure to air as this zone lies mostly above the high tide mark. Organisms are wetted mainly by wave splash and spray. There are three main life within the splash zone. Number one is the algae, lichens, and the cyanobacteria. Number two are the periwinkle. Number three are the limpets. For the algae, alicans, and cyanobacteria, they soak up water for long dry periods protected from drying out by jelly-like coating. For the periwinkle, abundantly occupy the splash zone, grazing on the algae by scraping it up from the rocks. They can breathe air, live out of water for months, and tolerate extreme temperatures. Most common predators come from land, such as birds, raccoon, rats, and other land animals. The high tide zone. The high tide zone is the area of the intertidal zone that is flooded during the peaks of the tide, maybe once or twice daily, and experiences long periods without water in between these peak times. There are four main life forms within the high tide zone. The barnacles, the limpets, the shore crabs, and the sea lice or sea roaches. The shore crabs occasionally venture into this zone, mostly scrape algae off rocks with claws, but also eat animal matter, dead or alive, act as predators to periwinkle and limpets. The sea lice or sea roaches breathe air and live above the water's edges, moving into the upper intertidal at low tide. The mid-tide zone. 
The mid-tide zone is the area that is submerged and covered by the tides on a regular basis, having a large amount of variation in immersion time. There are four main life forms of mid-tide zone. Number one are the different types of barnacles that can handle the variations of immersion. Number two are the hermit crabs. Number three are the mussels that tend to dominate other life forms in their area. They smoother or tend to overcrowd the area. Number four are the sea stars. They are predator to mussels. They insert their stomachs into the mussel shell and digest from the inside. Sea stars do not handle desiccation well, so they must act during times when the tide is in. In the mid-tide zone, the main predators are the sea stars. They profoundly affect the entire community. The low-tide zone. This is the zone that is immersed most of the time, making it easy for sea predators to feed. Organisms such as mussels and barnacles are rare in this zone. The main life forms of, in the low tide zone are four. Number one is the seaweed, which are the dominant, forming thick surfaces on rocks. They cannot tolerate drying out, so they grow profusely. Number two are the kelps. This marks the lower limit of the intertidal and continue down into the subtidal zone. Number three are the sea urchins, which are the common grazers on seaweed. Number four are the anemones, worms, snails, and slizags. Marine life within the rocky shore. Most rocky intertidal organisms live right on the rock surface so it is difficult to burrow through rocks. The epifauna, these are the animals that live on the surface of the substrate. The mobile epifauna, these are the animals that move about over the rocks. And the sessile epifauna, these are the animals that stay attached to the rocks. Living on the rock's surface, the organisms in the rocky intertidal are fully exposed to the elements, which subjects them to great physical stress. Problems rocky intertidal organisms face. 1. How do organisms deal with water loss? Low tide presents many problems for organisms of the rocky intertidal as they are left high and dry or exposed to the air. Degree of difficulty for survival depends on where the organisms reside in the intertidal. For those living higher in the intertidal zone, they are only immersed in water for a short period of time at high tide, and it may be they are only submerged during spring tides. The highest part of the intertidal, in fact, is almost never submerged and is kept wet by wave splash. For those living lower, lower in the intertidal zone, they are submerged most of the time and have to come with immersion for short periods of time. The lowest part of the intertidal, in fact, is almost always submerged and experiences immersion only at the most extreme low tide. Ultimately, the higher the organism resides within the intertidal zone, the more time they have to spend out of the water. In order to survive in the intertidal, an organism must be able to prevent desiccation, tolerate it, or both. Desiccation is the act or process of drying or desiccating something, or the state of being or becoming dried up. It is the removal or loss of moisture. Desiccation is coped with in one of two basic ways. Number one, organisms run and hide. The organism goes somewhere wet and waits for the tide to come back in. They run and hide in rock pools or under rocks. Number two, organisms clam up. They find some sort of protective covering like a shell that they can close to hold in water. They clamp themselves tightly to a rock to seal their opening. Crabs cope well in the intertidal zone. They are able to run and hide in rock pools or under rocks. However, this is not an option for most creatures. Problem number two. How do organisms deal with extreme temperatures? Extreme temperatures create problems other than desiccation for marine organisms. Sea temperatures are relatively constant and mild, but air temperatures can be much more extreme. At low tide, organisms are at the mercy of the sun's heat and the freezing cold of winter. Because tide pools are shallow, they too experience extreme temperatures. 
most intertidal organisms can handle a wide temperature range and tolerate temperatures through hiding, having light-colored shells, staying in damp areas, placing themselves within the wave spray, and through protective shell ridges that reflect heat. Problem number three, how do organisms deal with wave action? Ocean waves expend tremendous energy as they crash into the shore and rocky intertidal organisms are exposed to the full power of the sea. The impact of the waves varies along the shoreline. Some areas are sheltered from the surf, others are fully exposed. Ultimately, there is tremendous variation in the intensity of the wave impact. Organisms that are exposed to the force of the waves need some way to deal with wave shock. Sessile organisms anchor themselves firmly to the rocks to keep from being washed away. Mobile organisms cling strongly to rocks through suctioned feet. Intertidal fishes sink and stay to the bottom as they lack swim bladders. And some intertidal organisms have thicker shells than their counterparts from less exposed areas, which is an adaptation to wave shock. Problem number four. How do organisms deal high competition for space? An occupied space is often in short supply. Even in sheltered areas, intertidal organisms will drift away or be smashed against the rocks if they can't attach themselves to the substrate. Often, there is not enough room to go around and the lack of space limits rocky intertidal populations. Competition for space is a dominant biological factor in the intertidal. Ways to compete for space. Number one, be first to get to open spots. Number two, having effective means of dispersal and then either hold onto the space or reproduce rapidly. Number three, take over space already occupied. Examples of which are barnacles, undercut neighbors loosening them from rocks, owl limpets bulldoze out their intruders, Many grow over their competitors, mothering them or blocking precious sunlight needed for growth, and grow species into colonies, increasing space occupied by species. Soft bottom intertidal communities, a seabed that consists of fine grain sediments, mud and sand, usually are the bays, lagoons, and the mud flats. Biodiversity and productivity vary depending upon depth, light exposure, temperature, sediment, grain size, and abundance of microalgae and bacteria. The type of sediment depends on both the amount of water motion and the source of the sediment. The type of sediment also strongly influences the type of community. Intertidal or shallow soft bottom habitats include mudflats and seagrass meadows, which are economically and ecologically important, but in geographic terms comprise only a small part of this extensive habitat type. Overall, soft bottom is the ocean's largest benthic habitat, forming the bottom of most of the continental shelves as well as vast expanses at depths of 3,000 to 6,000 meters which cover more than 60% of Earth's surface. Subtitle soft bottom habitats are diverse based on distinct as organism assemblages that are influenced by differences in substrate type, organic content, and bottom depth. Shifting sediments. Soft bottoms are unstable and constantly shift in response to waves, tides, and currents. Very few seaweed have adapted to this environment. Seagrasses are the most common large primary producers. Main characteristics of soft bottom communities are as follows. They lack solid attachment sites and most burrow in sediment for protection and to keep from being washed away. Kind of sediment. The kind of sediment on the bottom, especially the size of the grain, is one of the most important physical factors affecting soft bottom communities. Examples are the sand, silt, clay, and mud, which ultimately refer to sediments of particular sizes, with sand being the most coarse, followed by silt and then clay. The term mud refers to silt and clay together. 
Most sediments are mixtures of different particle sizes and are described according to grain size, with composition directly related to the degree of water motion. Fine sediments remain suspended with a small amount of water motion, whereas coarse sediments settle out unless there is considerable flow. Soft bottoms stay wet after the tide is out, so the problem of desiccation is not as critical as in the rocky intertidal. The grain size affects this as coarse sand grain and dry out quite rapidly. As a result, coarse sand beaches have relatively little animal life. Soft bottom zonation because organisms live in the sediment where they can't be seen, zonation is not as obvious as that of the rocky intertidal. Zonation does exist, especially on sandy beaches. As water drains rapidly from the sand and the beach slopes, the upper part is drier than the lower part. The upper beach is inhabited by beach hoppers or the sand fleas and by isopods. In warmer areas, ghost and fiddler crabs occupy this area. The lower beach is inhabited by clams and other animals. Zonation is less obvious in muddy areas where the bottom is flat and fine sediments retain water. The habitat in these places does not change much between high and low tide. Problem soft bottom organisms face 1. How do organisms deal with low oxygen? The amount of organic matter in bottom sediments is important to deposit feeders who extract the organic matter from the sediments. The amount of matter depends on grain size. The grain size also affects the amount of oxygen that is available in the sediments. Oxygen in sediments is used by the respiration of animals and decay bacteria. Below the sediment surface, there is no light and no photosynthesis, so circulation of the water must replenish the oxygen supply. Organisms pump oxygen-rich waters from surface. Problem number two. How do organisms get around? Soft-bottom animals use a variety of methods to burrow through sediments. Clams and cockles are able to change the shape of their muscular foot using it as an anchor while they pull the rest of their body along. Some worms force their pharynx into cracks in the sediments to expand the crack before pulling their bodies along behind. Heart urchins burrow or plow through the sediment with their spines and tube feet. Crustaceans such as amphipods or sand crabs and ghost shrimp use their jointed appendages to dig. Deposit feeders solve two problems at once by eating their way through the sediment. Problem number three. How do organisms feed? Particles of dead organic matter are the main source of food in the soft bottom intertidal. Single-celled algae sometimes form highly productive mats on the sediment surface, but most often they don't account for much primary production. Most animals don't distinguish between the organic matter and the algae, and plankton brought in by the tides make a contribution to the food supply. Ways of feeding Some animals take in sediments as they borrow, digest it, and leave the rest of the sediment behind. Some animals use their tube feet to pick up organic particles. Some animals siphon food particles from the surface. Some animals catch particles as they settle. And some animals catch particles in suspension. Some filter food. Deposit feeders are the ones that feed on food that settles on the bottom, examples of which are crabs. The suspension feeders feed on food suspended in water. Soft bottom predators. Soft bottoms also have their share of predators. Moon snails burrow through the upper sediments looking for clams. Once they find a clam, they drill a hole in the shell and eat it. Polychaetes and other worms are also predators. Birds can be all major predator during low tide. Fish can come in at high tide, although they do not often eat the entire animal. Instead, they nip off siphons or other bits that stick out. Interdependence of rocky shores and soft bottom. 
Rocky reefs often border soft-bottom sandy areas. These two habitat types support very different communities of plants and animals, yet there is evidence of movements of materials and animals between these two distinct habitats. It was found that proximity to reefs affected the balance between predation and recruitment of benthic gastropods inhabiting seagrass beds. The intensity of predation on mussels on intertidal rocky reefs depended on the nature of the adjacent subtidal substratum. Where intertidal rocky reefs were bordered by soft bottom subtidal substrates, predation was such that all transplanted mussels were rapidly consumed if, except if protected by experimental cages. It was also found that influences of nearby mangroves on the numbers and types of fishes found in adjacent seagrass showing that there can be important interaction between distinct habitats. A few studies have also documented the influence of rocky reefs on the structure of adjacent sandy bottom assemblages, that the composition and structure of macrofaunal assemblages was generally different near and away from rocky reefs, whereas a few taxa showed consistent patterns. Most taxa showed spatially variable responses within and among reefs. Significant differences in assemblage structure of benthic macrofauna between the crests and throws of ripple marks was also observed. The structure of ripple marks, which means the width and height, was also affected by the presence of reefs, suggesting that reefs had an indirect effect on benthic assemblages via changes in the microtopography of the sediment. In addition, many rocky reefs associated fauna can forage over adjacent sandy areas, suggesting that soft sediment assemblages may have an important role in subsidizing these rocky reefs associated fauna. While some experimental evidence suggests predation can have a strong effect near reef edges, reducing the abundance of some organisms, for example, are the bivalves, other studies showed little predation effect. It is interesting to note that in all these cases, some taxa still responded to distance from reefs over and above the effect of predation, suggesting that sediment and predation may have additive or interactive effects on different taxa. However, there has been no simultaneous test of the effects of sediment type and predation explaining differences of assemblages close and away from rocky reefs. Thank you for watching!